is your host of Nepal and welcome to another episode of TFLS Talk. And today we have with us Shida Sen, product marketing at Seller Data. Shida, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, I am Sida. I am a product marketing manager at Seller Data. We have covered Seller Data before, so you know our audience they do know about the company. But since you are here, I would love to hear from you. What is Seller Data, and and what are the problem that you folks are solving? What are the areas you're focusing on? In a nutshell, we're an analytical database company, um, and we focus on making analytics simpler and allowing data engineers to build uh, new analytics projects faster. Uh, our product, Cellular Data Cloud, is a analytics service that is based on Starrocks, um, the open source OLAP database and query engine. Uh, the one thing that we focus on is to provide class leading query performance. And so we can leverage this to eliminate data pipelines for our users. So our users can go pipeline free. Uh, it shortens the amount of time for our users to develop new analytics projects and go into production faster. Can you explain when you say pipeline free, what does that actually mean? The concept of pipeline free data analytics is a shift in how we approach big data um, and data engineering. Uh, my observation is that for a lot of the existing challenges on the database side, um, the industry has relied heavily on data pipelines that the user have to build as workarounds. Uh, and those pipelines probably useful for solving the original problems, uh, but they often introduce more problems like costs, complexity, and governance issues, right? I think the most, the real innovation is in how we address these problems on data database level, on the database side, other than, you know, troubling our users, right? And I can give like kind of like two scenarios like, as examples. So first, let's talk about like data lake analytics, right? Data lakes are scalable, uh, they're cost efficient, and it's a place for you to throw all of your data in, right? Recently, there are like open data lake table formats like Apache Hootie and Apache Iceberg, right? they have given data lakes with data warehouse-like features including you know, indexing and transactional properties, right? Making data lake looks like a ideal choice for data warehouse scenarios, you know, for like low latency interactive, um, like customer facing analytics, right? So the, the users don't have to copy their data from the data lake into another service, you know, purely for query, query acceleration, right? But that's not really the case because most of the query engines available today uh, still rely on outdated technology or they're still optimized for ETL workloads. So not really ideal for, you know, data warehouse like low latency queries, right? And this forces the users to transfer and replicate their data into a pr pr proprietary data warehouse still um, for purely for fast query processing. This approach probably addressed the performance issue. To be frank, it does. But it introduces, you know, unnecessary costs into maintaining separate systems and copying the data. You know, it's bad for data governors uh, and maintaining the in data ingestion pipeline, right? Um, and another problem or another example I want to bring up is with multi-table joins. Uh, multi-table joins probably the most expensive thing you can do with. Uh, writing a SQL, right? Joins is, is expensive. And optimizing multi-table join is a big challenge. Um, and this is especially a challenge in the field of real-time analytics because most of the real-time OLAP databases struggle to perform joins at scale. So they actually force the users to implement the normalization pipeline, which is essentially pre-computation by uh, pre-joining the multiple tables together into a big flat table beforehand so the database doesn't have to handle the join, you know, at query execution, right? Um, this process is actually like setting money on fire. Uh, it's extremely efficient in terms of storage and compute, right? Users are building big flat tables that might never get used, right? It also adds complexity due to the need for, you know, specific technologies like, you know, Flink, those uh, stateful stream processing tools uh, to meet the strict freshness demands for uh, of uh, real-time analytics. It also makes the system rigid, right? As any business change in the upstream uh, that causes schema change on the original table 
And that requires a complete reconfiguration of the denormalization pipeline, uh, as well as you know, data backfilling of all of the related data. Right? And that's my second example. Um, but there's a silver lining, right? In our experience from our clients and our open source Starox users, both of these problems and even more problems can be solved on the database side. Uh, so the users, our users, don't have to go through this, you know, painful process of developing uh, those unnecessary data pipelines uh, to work around uh, the problems, right? And that's why we're building the new pipeline-free data analytics schema and architecture. Can you also talk a bit about, you know, where is the market or let's just look at a lot of new use cases are emerging. So when we do look at cellular data or we can look at a star, you know, rocks, uh, what kind of market evolution you're seeing today? Who is like, there are traditional use cases and then there are new emerging use cases because of new workloads. There are definitely new workloads uh, uh, that are valuable, but there are also traditional workloads that can benefit greatly from like newer technologies, right? You get better latency and you get better, uh, like you, you get better latency and uh, uh, like simpler uh, architectures, right? Because you can do more uh, with one system now. And you know, otherwise uh, in the back in the days, you probably have to have like each uh, one system for, for each kind of uh, workload that you run, right? Uh, so I think both. Can you also talk about that as organizations, so there are once again, Arishna, who have been around for a long time. At the same time, there are new companies. How challenging is it for them to, to move with time to upgrade and implement new data analytics solutions? For analytics solutions, a lot of them are on the cloud now, right? Uh, most of them are on the cloud now, and it's very different uh, on the cloud versus on-prem because, you know, if you want to test a new system on-prem, you have to buy all of the servers, right? Uh, and hire a bunch of people, develop the thing yourself, and then you can start testing. And by that time, probably spend like 90% of your, your budget already, right? But in the cloud, um, everything is elastic, right? Uh, so you can... So you can uh, actually, uh, with with the like the pay as you go cost structure of the public clouds, uh, you can actually get started uh, with f just a few hundred bucks with one person, two three days, and you can get started on a uh, testing a new solution, right? So it's way cheaper that way, and also um, like I just talked about. Uh, with newer technologies, we can definitely simplify uh, the data pipeline, right? So there's less stuff you have to build from your POC to your uh, production, right? Like say for data lake analytics, data lake can do a lot more now paired with modern uh, query engines such as Starox. Uh, so you can actually run your very demanding workloads on the data lake without actually moving your data into another data warehouse, right? And that saves a lot of trouble. And the same thing goes for joins and denormalizations, right? Modern query engines can ha handle joins at scale. So you don't have to build the denormalization pipelines where you would have to uh, like back in the day, right? So the answer is yes. Uh, so it's a lot easier now than before to test a new analytics uh, solution. A few days ago, a few weeks ago, on, on Twitter also Kelsey Hightower wrote that, you know, if you look at the world around us, it's all about data. You just put in different boxes, you know, but it is all about data. All the software we write is that to extract the value out of data or to present it to users, uh, which is, I, I want to talk about a new kind of workload, which is emerging, which is, of course, generative AI. I want to understand, you know, from seller data's perspective, how do you folks look at generative AI either as a workload or to leverage generative AI for seller data solutions? The vector database has been, you know, like hot topic uh, in the past year, right? Um, people use a vector database as a long-term memory for large language models, right? Um, and not on the seller data side, but in the community, uh, we have some a lot of contributions from our our community users uh, to make Star Rocks work as a vector database, and um, it's great to see 
uh, those contributions and a lot of innovative projects that's building around uh, the SARS community. I also want to talk a bit about uh, the open source aspect here and the community. Talk about the importance of open source and talk about the community around uh, your technologies and solutions. Open source is magic. Uh, actually, before I was working as uh, product marketing, uh, in marketing, I was actually a product manager for the Staros Core. Uh, having a community with thousands of active users, we get the firsthand insight faster than everybody else, right? We can develop something uh, and have a user telling me what we develop is wrong uh, in like four four hours after we release. Uh, so that is magic. And also, like for database, it's complex, right? especially with you know like query planning and distributed compute. Uh, for our optimizer and for a lot of a lot of other features, actually all of our features, we release we GA them before. Uh, testing with our seed users. Uh, and we, that's only possible. We have a active community. Uh, so thank you, Saros <laughs> community, for making that happen for us. We can break this question in two parts. Number one question can be, just talk about the, imp talk about the impact of you know, people on companies. Do you feel that they are enough data scientists, DNA engineers, that companies need to keep up with that? Or you feel, no, there is shortage? Good technology should not require a lot of labor. Um, and they're supposed to be easy to use. Um, and also good technology actually simplifies uh, the pipeline and simplifies the technology like what we do, right? Um, so, you know, like uh, if you're, so the answer is actually if you're using the right technology, uh, no, you should not lack uh, labor. But if you're not, and that's certainly possible, so that's a time that you think about your technology stack and where the labor is being spent on. If you're doing analytics, are they, are they using, uh, are they busy ingesting data into a data warehouse uh, instead, of, instead of querying the data on the data lake? Or are they building unnecessary optimization pipelines or other type of pipelines? And is there any technology you can replace with newer ones that you don't have to uh, build those data pipelines that are expensive and labor intensive. If you can talk about Celerita solutions which are targeted at these audience. So what we offer is Celerita Cloud and, uh, you know, uh, that is Celerita Cloud is built to handle low latency, complex OLED queries at scale, right? Uh, so the main purpose of what we build uh, is to deliver extreme query performance to let our users have data warehouse performance on the data lake. Right, so they can run high concurrency, low latency OLAP workloads, such as customer facing analytics directly on the data lake without moving the data, right? Um, and also Celadata Cloud is really good at running complex multi-table join queries at scale with low latency. So allowing our users to ditch denormalization, especially you know, in real time analytics, right? Um, as an example, you know, I think a good example is Airbnb's Minerva platform. Uh, and that's a platform, that's a metric platform that holds six petabytes of data, right? Before they adopted Starrox, they were running Trino as a query engine for the data lake and copy data into Apache Druid for query acceleration, right? Apache Druid and Trino cannot really handle multi-table join queries at scale. So denormalization was a must for all of their data creating a flat table for all of the six petabytes of data that they have was expensive. And not only storage, but, but compute, right? To create the flat tables that, that never get used. Uh, so the whole denormalization pipeline also make the system rigid. A single schema change, which is kind of normal for a metric platform, right? Could take from hours up to days because of the need for reconfiguring the entire pipeline and data backfilling on you know, petabyte scale, right? Um, and then they move Minerva to Starrox. Uh, with all of the data handled by Starrox, there was no more data copying, right? No more data ingestion. So there was only one copy of the data and that's great for data governance, right? And Starrox can perform joins operations well as well. 
So well enough that denormalization is only done on demand for extreme cases instead of default for every single table, right? And that really decreased their cost overhead and also make their analytics flexible to uh, business changes. One more question that I have for you is that uh... I, I don't want to go to deep detail of what is better, uh, better data warehouse or data lake, but you know, customers they may choose to keep their data where they want. Uh, irrespective of where the data is, how do you make it cost effective and more kind of once again optimized for them, irrespective of where their data is, so they can get more value out of it? At the same time, if you can share some advice, how organizations should approach where they're putting their data to extract most value. Data lakes are cost efficient, right? They're scalable and it's a place to dump all of your data, right? But back in the day, limited by um, by the, the query engines, the performance of the query engines, a lot of your workloads needed to be extracted from the data lake. So you have to copy your data from your data lake to a high performance data warehouse, proprietary data warehouse, right? Going from open formats to closed formats, also duplicating your data, right? That makes everything expensive, right? Uh, but with newer technologies, modern query engines now can actually get data, data warehouse-like performance on directly on the data lake, right? So you don't have to go through that data ingestion, data copying process, uh, right? Which are expensive. So my advice would be to keep your your high performance demanding scenarios like customer facing scenarios on the data lake and give newer technology a try, right? And that's actually possible today. Siddha, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about, of course, you know, real-time analytics for data lakes, but also a lot of broader questions. Uh, thanks for all those insights. And I would love to uh, talk to you folks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.